Ryan Holiday, our guest this afternoon, is the best-selling author of Trust Me, I'm Lying, The Obstacle is the Way, Ego is the Enemy, and other books about marketing, culture, and the human condition. His work has been translated into 28 languages, including Spanish, and has appeared everywhere from the Columbia Journalism Review to Fast Company. His company, Brass Check, has advised companies such as Google, Taser, and Complex, as well as multi-platinum musicians and some of the biggest authors in the world. He lives in Austin, Texas. All right. All right. So Ryan, I've been um, a huge fan of your work and you know, following your, your career since uh, the Tim Ferriss, Stoicism Post days. Uh, and something that I noticed about your latest book was that it was very much kept uh, under wraps. Yeah. Yeah, was that, um, so can you tell us if that was by design? Can you tell us more about uh, your, your newest release? Um, yeah, so usually like you announce a book when it comes out and you tell people you're working on it because you want like sort of pre-publicity attention. Um, with this one, there was like a number of other people sort of circling around it. And so uh, I, I sold it first, but then I didn't want to tell people that I'd sold it because I wanted them to think that they had more time. Uh, so we sort of kept it secret for a long time. I sold it instead of like going out uh, to an auction to sell the rights to it. I sold it to my same publisher that I usually sell my books to. Um, and then, you know, I, when I was interviewing people, I told people that it was a book about media, which it is, but it's also about other things, you know. Uh, and so, it, it, yeah, it was sort of secret, and I think part of it was just fun. I mean, it's a book about conspiracies, so it was fun to be a little bit conspiratorial. And then when we announced it, we sort of, when we did announce it, the book was already like three quarters of the way written, so I had a big lead, I felt comfortable. And then when we said when it was coming out, we put the release date earlier than it really probably ever was going to be, um, just to sort of go like, there's no way you're gonna beat us on this. You know, I think, and I heard from, when it was announced, I heard from a bunch of other writers that were like, they are basically like, God damn it, like. Uh, you beat me to You it. beat me and now I'm not gonna do it. So that was sort of the idea. Mm -hmm. yeah. And <laughs> Nice, well, well done. Yeah, it worked, it and worked. So yeah, like this book, like this storyline, it's so like, it's crazy. It seems like something straight out like at the 19th century, where you have like these crazy characters from disparate backgrounds and like, the greatest crossovers, things like Marvel's Infinity War. And yeah, I mean, if you, made, if you made up, the, like, if, if, so first off, just the simple story, which is, okay, this, this was a story of the professional wrestler Hulk Hogan having sex with his best friend's wife. <laughs> uh, his best friend was legally named Bubba the Love Sponge. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, Bubba the Love Sponge was secretly recording them having sex. And then uh, that tape is stolen, leaked. Uh, a website runs it, and then Hulk Hogan sues the website, sues Gawker for $100 million, and wins in court many years later, and Gawker's put out of business. That would be weird, and like that itself was an insane story that got headlines all over the world. I mean, that was crazy. And then to zoom out, you know, a few months later and find that actually, like, a, an enigmatic libertarian billionaire had put the entire uh, set of events into motion, and he'd done so because nine years previous, that website had outed him as gay. Like, it's just, un, it's un, and then to flash forward and find out that the same lawyers who were involved on both sides of this end up uh, representing and fighting a case between the President of the United States, who is Donald Trump of all people, and Stormy Daniels, the porn star. Like, it's just, I mean, you, if, if, I, if I was, we were spitballing this idea, and I was throwing, you'd be like, you would have cut me off at some point. You'd be like, we don't need any more. <laughs> this is already completely unbelievable. Like, it's like a choose your own adventure one where you pick like the most ridiculous of all the options over and over and over again until it sounds, it sounds like something that could not have possibly happened, let alone, like, history is weird. But I do feel like things are less weird in them. Like, part of the reason this story was so such big news is like, people don't do shit like this anymore. You know, like if if you if you heard that like Cornelius Vanderbilt like sued a media outlet for you know embarrassing him, you'd be like, oh okay, that's what they did back then. But like it's it's much stranger. I think that this happened in. The verdict came down in 2016. It's very weird. Yeah, and kind of to follow along that thread. Um, 
it's, it seems amongst like our peer group that there was sort of two lines drawn where like one side of the um, sandbox, so to speak, very much said, you know, this is a great example of what happens when um, you do things that aren't right. You, yeah. And then the other side was like, wait, actually, you know, a billionaire just, just bankrupted a, yeah. a journalism company. Like this is the end of journalism as we know it. Like what sure. president has this said? Yeah, it, it, well, it is weird because there was this period and you can see what people thought during this two months Two month period, you can see basically up through the trial. Uh, in fact, the coverage of Gawker during the trial is universally, ne almost universally negative. These people deserve what's happening to them, even from the media itself. Like, how could they do this? You know, AJ Delario's uh, testimony uh, is like a sort of media crisis where almost everyone is uniformly, you know, sort of anti Gawker at this point. Then the verdict happens, and the verdict surprises everyone and just how enormous it is. I mean, like, Obviously, being uh, having a, a stolen sex tape of you run has damages. Are those damages one hundred and forty million dollars? Right, that's pretty enormous. So, like, but still, people were almost that there was very in this two month period between the verdict and when Teal's involvement is revealed, the story is seen as as much less ominous as it is after his unmasking. Mm -hmm. Right. So there is a period where people. Even, even the New York Times, like the, the co-counsel of the New York Times has interviewed a New York Times story and he's like, there's like no precedent here. He's like, basically, you just don't run sex tapes of celebrities without permission, you know? Um, it's only when Teal's involvement that suddenly everything, all the, all the history is revised and the entire narrative shifts, which in some ways Teal should have anticipated, like that he didn't, I think there was some naiveness there or some wishful thinking about how it would be seen. Like, he is the, you're, as soon as you win, you're not the underdog anymore, right? And so, as soon as, and, and, and so there's that part of it. But then the idea, like, people go, like, he just set this, pre I mean, he did nothing that hasn't been done many times in the past. The difference here is that, the, is that media outlets don't usually run stories that open them up to such enormous damages judgments. And they usually settle cases long before they ever go. Like media companies know like basically you don't let cases get in front of a jury. Because once it gets in front of a jury, you know, the jury's not sitting there thinking they have this immense constitutional obligation. You know, in this case they were like, man, you really screwed over this whole Kogan guy who's from the town that we live in. Like, fuck you, you know? Mm -hmm. I think that was the jury's verdict. You know, that was, the, that re was what reflected the jury's verdict. So um, I, think the, I think in a weird way, I think the precedent is much less than sort of media, media sort of uh, personalities and, and, and academics and stuff want to make you think there is. Mm -hmm, that's fair. And um, to kind of follow along with that too, something that I found really fascinating was that, you know, Gawker, you know, they have Value Wag, which is where the article went up, but then they have this other outlet called Jezebel, yes. which I believe it still, might still be running. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, Jezebel was very much of the like of like, you know, protecting, you know, female celebrities, you know, you know <coughs> going out of their way to make sure that things, that leaks like this don't happen and get posted on their site. So isn't that kind of a hypocrisy in and of itself? Well, to be perfectly fair, I mean, like, there's conservative voices at the New York Times and liberal mm -hmm. voices at the New York Times and different editors at different times, different divisions. There's, they're not going to necessarily always be, like, a uniform point of view from any media mm -hmm. outlet. Just like YouTube or uh, Google has different departments that do different things, and sometimes it feels like those are in conflict with each other when really they're just sort of not overlapping. Mm -hmm. So it's not... I don't think you want to paint it as too hypocritical, but there is an interesting, I mean, there's one quote I have in the book from a Jezebel, they were like, uh, they were, the, the story says like, do not out people who do not want to be outed, like end of story, mm -hmm. you know? And, and it's like, and then it says like, everyone has a right to privacy. And so there is some irony that the media outlet that owns Jezebel would then be destroyed when they egregiously out one person mm -hmm. and egregiously violate the privacy of another person, and then at any point, instead of apologizing or settling the case or some admission of wrongdoing, mm -hmm. um, they take it all the way to a jury, and then those exact words are held against them in that court of law. Yeah, that was really interesting about how like, at no point did they ever just stop and say, 
wow, maybe we should just settle. Maybe we just apologize. Like, is it well, they did try to settle. Like much later on, they tried to settle. But I, I, the right thing to do, I think, strategically would have been so. So Hogan files the case in 2012. He does not. Know, it's a hundred million dollar case, but I don't think they necessarily thought they would be winning a hundred million dollars. It's not until after the discovery and then as Gawker, as they go through the case, that their their odds get. So if Gawker had taken it seriously at the outset, and maybe they'd. Well, first off, they get two cease and desist orders that tell them, you know, the demand they take, they take down. So if they'd taken it down then, we wouldn't even be talking here. Uh, but so they ignore it. But then if at some point they looked at the, the, the actual merits of the case and they said, look, this isn't worth fighting. You know, let's pay this guy a half million dollars to go away. Or, you know, we offer him a certain amount, an apology. I think Hogan would have taken it. But as the case wound on, Hogan is sort of lost like he ends up losing his job because of it, you know, uh, because of things he did. He said some racist things on the same tape. But like Hogan sort of got to this point of no return, and and so it was less less and less and less likely that he would settle. I think it's more that had Gawker had Gawker taken a tack that was essentially like, look, we're a media outlet. Our job is to run stories. We ran this story because we thought it was newsworthy at the time. Uh, we, we believed that we were within our rights to publish it. We did not uh, intentionally uh, hurt anyone. We've taken the story down. We've apologized. We've attempted to settle this case many times. I think that, would have, that legal strategy would have played much better in that courtroom than the legal strategy which they did run, which was like, First, we can run anything we want. Why are we even here? Mm -hmm. And then two, we believe this story was newsworthy, mm -hmm. which is what they claimed. But then that opened up Teal's legal team to be able to go, OK, what research did you do before running this story? Mm -hmm. Why was it newsworthy? Why did you say in your deposition that you didn't believe it was newsworthy? Right. So they really, I, I think in some ways, they did not get great legal advice. And they ended up fighting this. They were, look, they were fighting. They weren't fighting on First Amendment grounds. They were fighting on a right to pri they were fighting a right to privacy case in Florida, and they were fighting you know the intentional infliction of emotional distress. And so this idea of we've said before that no one should be outed, that you shouldn't be hurt, made it look very intentional and very difficult to defend. Mm -hmm. So 2007, they write this article about Peter Thiel. Yeah. 2012, they post the Hulk Hogan video. Mm -hmm. So then how did Hulk Hogan and Peter Thiel like, link up? Because I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm assuming there's a lot of people that had vendettas against Gawker. Yeah, yeah. It's, they, it, obviously, they weren't like friends beforehand, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> uh, actually, I went to a, a dinner at Thiel's house, sort of a victory dinner when I was writing the book, um, which is in, in the hills. And, and Hogan was there. This is the first time they'd ever, this was in 2000, early 2017. It was the first time they'd ever met or been in the same room together. Um, at this, so this is months after the verdict. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they and, and, and Hogan actually um, did not know who was backing his case. He just knew that a wealthy businessman or group of businessmen was, was doing the case. And that was, in some ways, I think, how they were able to keep it secrets for so long. Mm -hmm. But um, what happened was, so in 2011, Teal had embarked on the strategy of, OK, we think that in Gawker's archives, there are causes of action. There are articles they've written that have crossed some line, whether it's a copyright violation. Maybe they were running photos they didn't have the rights to. Maybe they were. Um, they thought maybe there'd be something on the affiliate commissions, like they weren't disclosing that they were taking an affiliate cut. Or maybe that they'd violated someone's privacy, um, you know, any, any number of, of sort of violations that they would they would find people who were willing to let Teal back their case against Gawker, mm -hmm. and they really didn't find anything right away. They looked, but they didn't find anything. And so it's not until October of 2012 that the tape runs, and Hogan had actually been very public about his intention to sue whoever mm -hmm. runs it, and Gawker was aware of this as well. You know, there's like a there's like a TMZ headline that's like, uh, and you can see this all in the legal documents, but there's a TMZ headline that's like, Hogan, I will sue whoever runs sex tape, right? And then uh, the publicist at TMZ sends it to Gawker's tip line, which goes to all their editors. So like they knew that this was going to happen, or they knew that there was a risk of it happening. 
Um, and so he'd been very public about it. And then Gawker runs it. And that's the, that's, Teal is at that point laying in wait for something like that to happen. Mm -hmm. So they see the tape when it runs like everyone else. And then Charles Harder, who's, who's uh, the lawyer that was sort of running the conspiracy, mm -hmm. puts a call into Hogan and says, hey, do you need any help? Mm -hmm. And that sets this in motion. Got it. And um, earlier when we were kind of describing the, the characters in, in this book, there was one that we didn't mention yet, which is Mr. A. Sure. And he's kind of, so two questions there. Okay. The first one is, could he have, was Mr. A the only option for a secret agent name? Uh, no, I mean, I, it's, I guess you're right. It's not like the most creative, and you know, it's not deep throat or something cool <laughs> like that. Uh, but uh, no, I think, I think he didn't want his identity mm -hmm. known. And that was the, that, I wouldn't have chosen Mr. A, but that's the name they, mm -hmm. they that I first heard from them. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay, we'll use that. We'll run with it. Yeah. And so he was really the one that brought this plan to, to Teal. He basically pitches it like a tech startup. He's like, like he has a dinner with Teal in, in Berlin in, in April of 2011. Mm -hmm. And they're sitting there and, you know, Teal's used to getting pitched. And, and he says like, hey, look, I know you don't like Gawker. Like I have this idea. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the remark, and not just like, is it kind of remarkable that he pitches this? I think the remarkable thing about that meeting is he actually says, I think it'll take three to five years, and I think it'll cost roughly $10 million. And that's almost exactly what happened. Wow. So he completely called it. Uh, but yeah, like this 26 year old kid pitches, you know, uh, Peter Thiel on this idea, and Thiel sort of backs it on the spot. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it sets in motion all this stuff that. You know, we, no one, the meeting's in 2011, no one, no one even knows of Mr. A's existence until the book came out in February of 2018. So yeah, something about like incredible. a Facebook post or something, right? Like a photo? Well, no, no, some, some people obviously in Teal's orbit knew, mm -hmm. and obviously the people involved in the conspiracy, they, Mr. A was the one interacting with people. That's how Teal kept his distance. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I'm saying that like his involvement in it was totally secret until even the publication of the book. So um, I guess it just goes to show, like, on the one hand, uh, secrecy is really important. But two, this thing that had been covered by, like, every major media outlet on the planet didn't go, like, I think what's fascinating is that it was actually easier for people to hold on to the idea that this billionaire was mm -hmm. personally, like, reviewing legal documents uh, than the idea that he might have paid someone to help him. Like that, that but so it, I think it, it's also illustrative of just like how little we understand how things work and how superficial, how, how much, how willing we are to just sort of stop at the surface. Be like, oh, okay. Like we're like, oh, Hogan suing Gawker. Okay, that's what it is. Uh -huh. And then it was like, oh, Peter Thiel backed it. Okay, that's what it is. Uh -huh. No one was like, well, what's the real story, you know? And that's why this didn't, didn't get out. Mm -hmm. And um, so in this book, you had access to Mr. Teal, uh, to Nick Denton, uh, Hulk Hogan as well. Um, how, how did that come to be? How did, did both of them reach out to you? Did Gawker and, and Teal's camp come forward with information, or did you reach out to them? Yeah, so Teal emailed me first uh, because he'd read some of the, my, I have a media column for The Observer, which he had read, so he liked something. He just sent me an email. He said, um, hey, uh, like I liked your column. We should, um, he said, uh, next time you're in New York or uh, San Francisco, he said, we should have dinner and we should talk about the MBTO. And then in parentheses, he says, Manhattan-based terrorist organization, which is how he'd always referred to Gawker, I guess. So the, he's already sort of giving me this glimpse into how it worked. So we ended up talking. And then, so I was thinking about doing a book about it. And then independently, uh, Nick Denton reached out to me because he'd read my more philosophical writing uh, and like that. And we were talking about that, and then I, I basically was like, hey, look, I'm talking to Teal. Mm -hmm. Will you talk to me? And the fact that I was talking to both of them, I think, contributed to the, sort of became a dynamic where neither of them necessarily wanted to disengage mm -hmm. because uh, then, then it would be lopsided in favor of their mortal enemy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, something that, that really stood out from your description of, of Teal in the book was that, uh, and this is a quote from the book, it's, you describe him as, quote, as if he is always in the process of deciding what he thinks, which is beautiful. Can you talk more about that line? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it's beautiful necessarily, but I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, no, when you're talking to Teal, it's, it's strange. He has this tick. At first I thought it was a tick, and then I realized it was more, it was deeper than that. 
Like if you ask him a question, like if you ask me a question, mm -hmm. and then I was just like, that. See, so you're like getting uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah, because like you're like, why am I not? And so he's he really just stops and thinks about everything before he answers. And so it's actually weird. Like I'm I get uncomfortable from that myself. And so like I'd always be like, oh, did I like ask the wrong question? Should I ask a different question? Mm -hmm. And like. And then by the time I'd start the second question, he, he was just getting around to his first answer, mm -hmm. you know? And so then, then it was like this sort of comedy of like, you go this way, I'll go this way, you know? But he, he's very, I think he, he's a very deep thinker. Mm -hmm. He's a very considerate thinker, not necessarily considerate to other people, but I mean, he really considers and deliberate about his word. Like there's not much sloppiness there. Like he's not willing, He's not willing to just like pull something out of his ass. Mm -hmm. Like he's really going to think about it. And then what I think is interesting is that he has, he does this every time, even if it's something he's talked about before. Mm -hmm. So he's sort of. Like he's willing to change his opinion. Well, no, it's like he's all, instead of going, instead of like having this shortcut, like, okay, I already have an opinion about X. So like, that's my opinion. Like if you ask it him, I think he, he almost like goes to first principles and thinks about it from scratch mm -hmm. again. Like, uh, so that's why there's the delay. Like he's not utilizing the shortcuts that most of us are doing. And so I think this does, this is a much more, this is a, a much less sloppy way to think and act and talk. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's, that's where I think some of these b deeply counterintuitive, if not occasionally strange insights come from, mm -hmm. is that he's, He's not just winging it. Mm -hmm. Got it. So this is very much a new type of book for you. Yeah. And you know, I saw somewhere, maybe you read it, maybe your website, that you read something like 25,000 pages of legal documents. Yeah. Wow. A lot. So, so tell us then, um, can you tell us about the process of writing a new type of book? What was that like? Well, you know, my other books, they're all about basically dead people. They're either about me or they're about dead people, mm -hmm. right? So uh, <laughs> that's much easier. Um, and my, most of my books are not chronological. So like I'm just telling different stories here or there of stuff that's interesting to me. Mm -hmm. This was harder because like I like a set of things happened and they happened in a specific order, mm -hmm. and then I had to tell them more or less in that order. Mm -hmm. So I had to first just figure out what happened. So obviously I, I haven't done a lot of interviews for my previous books, so that was new. Um, I had to read a lot of legal documents, which is definitely new. There was like it was 17 binders. 25,000 pages. And that was after we got rid of all the unnecessary pages, like all the redundant pages mm -hmm. or duplicates or whatever. Um, yeah, so I had to re so yeah, it was different. I, I just had to come up with a different methodology for writing. Like mm -hmm. I had to do much more outlining, organization. Um, it was just different. But I think, I, I, think it was, it, I enjoyed the challenge of it for mm -hmm. sure. And it's, got it. And um, I read, a, I think it was last week, that the book's been optioned. It has, yeah. It's There's a movie. It, a movie or a TV show? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. My other books have been optioned before, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes they happen, sometimes they don't. But that, like, a bunch of really big people are interested in it. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. I mean, I, I hope it happens. I mean, mm -hmm. you could not invent a more cinematic series of events. I mean, like I said, it, it, it feels like fiction or history. I mean, it's the... It's basically the Count of Monte Cristo in modern days is, is sort of how I've been describing it. So, in Silicon Valley and in Florida. Yes, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a crazy story. So it would be great. It sort of reminds me of like uh, the People versus O.J. Simpson, mm -hmm. uh, like a sort of a contained legal drama. Um, so yeah, I hope it'll happen. We'll see. Nice. Well, wish you the best of luck with that. And to kind of switch tracks here a little bit. Okay. Um, you know, you read a lot about strategy, and you know, it's a it's a theme in you know your your other books. It's yeah. also the underlying theme in, in this book as well. And to kind of start off with um, a quote that um, I think it was from a master chess player. It said that to begin with, you must study the end. You don't want to be the first to act. You want to be the last man standing. Yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit? So that's one of Thiel's favorite quotes, which is why it's in the book, mm -hmm. uh, and it's from uh, Raul Capablanca. And, I, and his point is that you have to know where you're trying to end up, mm -hmm. so then you can evaluate your decisions mm -hmm. with that end in mind. What oftentimes it happens is we, we're like, oh, I generally want to go in a direction, mm -hmm. and then we make decisions that take us, you know, because the decisions compound on each other, mm -hmm that take us in a completely different direction. Mm -hmm. So I think 
Um, in this case, for instance, Teal wasn't, Teal wasn't thinking, oh, I would like to just like hurt Gawker. Mm -hmm. I think he was like, I want Gawker to not exist at the end, mm -hmm. right? Uh, which is uh, somewhat ominous and, and, and can be scary depending on where you sit. But he had a very clear end in mind, which I think is the in strategic imperative. Like you have to, what are we trying to accomplish? What does success look like? Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that, how can you properly evaluate opportunities and decisions as they come up? Mm -hmm. You can't. Mm -hmm. you're, 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 you're looking too short term. And so you, the decisions, the logic that you're doing might make sense in those individual decisions, but they, they get you further. So the way this would apply in, your, in ordinary life would be like, if you don't know what you want to do, if you don't know where you want to end up, if you don't know what like sort of happiness or success looks like, you end up, you're offered a promotion, but it requires you to move to a place you don't want to live in, mm -hmm. right? Or you end up t getting paid more money, but now you have to work more hours so you're less happy. Or um, you, there's this opportunity to do this thing in your career, but it, it, it's gonna inflict a certain amount of stress or damage that your marriage cannot sustain. Mm -hmm. And so people end up making short-term decisions mm -hmm. where it's like, of course, if someone offered you X amount of dollars, you should accept it. Or who wouldn't wanna live in this city? Well, maybe the answer is you, yeah. right? And so you, it, it, we, we go, oh, I should do this or I have to do this because it makes so much overwhelming sense in the context of these two options. Mm -hmm. But what you're not seeing is the, over here, you have your giant pool of options, and this is shrinking as a result of one decision mm -hmm. or another. And so, um, like, for me, I love writing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, I'm, I'm pretty good at it, and it's what makes me happy. Like, I'm happy when I'm writing. But then I get offered all sorts of other opportunities in life uh, that can shrink or expand the amount of time that I have to do writing. And so if I don't know what the end, what I'm working towards, what I want my life to look like, then I'm gonna be, of course I should go here, or of course I should do this, or of course I should hop on the phone with this person. Mm -hmm. But it's actually, it's a short-term success that's causing a long-term failure. Mm -hmm. That's, um, and that's something I think about quite a bit. I think, you know, in our peer group, you know, we're both, you're, what, from 87? Yep. We're Reagan babies, 87 as well. Okay. Um, and, you know, it seems to me that my group of friends and my colleagues kind of fall into one of two camps. It's either I have too many options and I don't know which one to take. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to optimize for. Mm -hmm. Or I don't know what I want to do. I have no options and I'm just, like, stuck here. And I feel like there's kind of, like, this, this balance of, like, you want to not be so focused that you only have one and yeah. like one destination, but you also don't want to be so broad that everything is now an option. Yeah, right, those are two sides of the mm -hmm. same coin in the sense that like if you, don't, if you don't know what you want to do, it looks like you have less opportunities than you actually do. Like if you know, okay, if you know clearly here's what I want to do, there's lots of little, you might not be, you might not have some world changing opportunity right in front of you, but you have little things you can do that might put you on the path to get where you want to go, mm -hmm. right? And, and then, yeah, if you have too many options and you don't know what you want to do, this is obviously a champagne problem. Like, mm -hmm. many people would kill to be there. But how you, you're not going to optimize or, or make the right decision in that set of circumstances because you don't know which option is better than the other options. And there's always a, a better option, I would think. So mm -hmm. um, I think this is also true as a business. If you, don't know what, if you don't know what your business is and what your business does, how do you know which opportunities are in your wheelhouse and which ones are outside your wheelhouse? Mm -hmm. And then how do you balance this idea of like being happy with, you know, what life has given you or the things that you've worked for and then going for like the next step? Like how do you know when an impulse is ambition or if it's going to come at a cost of, you know, more fame, more glory, yeah. which is in a way those are good things, but you know, what's the cost to that? Well, I mean, that's like, yeah, that's the million dollar question. How, how do you know? I, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't have like, Here's, here's the answer to all of life's problems in one sentence, uh, I wish. Um, but I, I do think you, here's how I do it. Mm -hmm. I go, what do I want like my day to look like? Mm -hmm. Like I think about it in terms of one day. Like one day, like right now, what do I want one day to look like in five years, in 10 years? Like what do I want like my life to look like? Mm -hmm. And then I try to make decisions that get me to that life, right? So um, I had a conversation with someone uh, 
I had a conversation with someone pretty early on in my career. I'd, I'd been successful early, and, he, and, and I was thinking about doing something, and he said, um, you know, he's like, what do you do with your money? And I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, like what do you do? Like, do you buy boats, or do you, you know, uh, save it, or, you know, do you give it all to charity? Like, what do you do with your money? And I was like, I don't really do anything with it. It just, like, sits in a bank account. Like, I, I, I live a relatively, like, cheap lifestyle, and I have what I want to have, so I don't, like, need it, right? And he was like, so why are you doing this thing? Like, why are you doing this thing that you don't really like to get more of a thing that you're saying you don't really need? And so that uh, the, the long way of saying that, I realized that, like, having more or less money within a range, like a, a normal, not like a billionaire range or even a, you know, just a normal range, uh, was, like, not affecting my life in any positive or negative way, right? So it was like, oh, okay, what do I, then, then what, do, what, what do, what does it positively or negatively affect my life? It's like, I fucking hate going to meetings. <laughs> I hate living in certain places that I've lived. You know, I hate getting on the phone for no reason. You know, so like, it's like, oh, okay, so I'm going to make, uh, the decisions I should make should not be like, is this going to make a lot of money or, you know, is this going to get me a lot of media attention? But like, is this thing going to increase the amount of phone calls that I have to be on or decrease the amount of phone calls that I want to live on? Or is this going to free me up to live where I want to live? Or is it going to force me to spend a lot of time in a place that I don't want to be? Mm -hmm. And so that is kind of how I evaluate those decisions. Mm -hmm. Got it. And another quote that really stuck out to me was um, from B.H. Lytle Hart. Mm -hmm. You know, in strategy, the longest way around is often the shortest way home, yeah. which is you know, in a way kind of changed my life in a good way, where it's like, ah. Okay. What does it mean to you? Like, it's, to me, it things that, like, it's, it's kind of that idea that you have to start from the end and work backwards, where okay. you have to kind of, like, have that objective in mind and, like, know that it's, it's not going to be there immediately. Like, you know, for example, like, let's say that, you know, I want to write for a major blog. Okay. You know, um, well, it's going to be very hard to, like, write for, let's say, Fast Company. Yeah. But if I can write for a few... Uh, lesser known blogs yeah. or maybe some very specific ones to build my credibility right it's going to take longer as opposed to me just pitching the guy at fast company yeah but if i can prove myself in these three blogs i can then package that give myself some credibility and then go talk to the guys at fast company or you could do all that and then you might get an incoming email from them asking you exactly right? yeah no mm -hmm. that's what i think that's what the quote means yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah oftentimes we try and i think this ties into the conspiracy thing uh or what happened in this specific conspiracy which is that we think you should do the straightforward or the obvious yes. thing. That's mm -hmm. like, oh, okay, like Teal said, they outed me. So uh, I think the, the more reactionary person in that situation would go, I'm going to sue you for that. You shouldn't be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, the law is pretty clear. I mean, there's some debate. The law is pretty clear that it's not illegal to out someone. Mm -hmm. It might be in bad taste. It might not be cool. Um, it might cause consequences for them. But there's not, even if you were to win, um, one, the verdict would probably not be very large. And two, I'm not sure it would send that much. It, it, it might almost send the opposite message that Teal would want to send. It, it, you're essentially, are, in that case, you would be arguing that you outed me as gay and it's bad to be gay. So by making me see, being seen as gay, you've hurt me, right? That's not, like, that's not a strong position. Mm -hmm. So he waits. I mean, he waits for four years until 2011 now the meeting, and then he waits until another, so a total of five years, basically, until he filed a case. The whole, co the running and illicitly recorded sex tape that the person had loudly said do not run, that cease and desist had been violated, or had ignored, et cetera, is a much stronger case. Mm -hmm. So that's the long way home, right? That's mm -hmm. the long way around. He waited five years for this opportunity. But you could argue that from the minute they filed that case like they were on a track to win. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, but had he, had he filed a case in 2007 or a, a weaker case in 2008 or 2009, it might have gone to trial much faster, but what it would have accomplished would have been far less. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah, it, it almost seems like, again, going back to you know, our peer group, our colleagues, our coworkers, our friends, you know, it seems one of the recurring themes is this, this want to immediately dart towards the finish line. Yeah. to like immediately get to wherever it is we're going. And I think that you know, one of the downsides to that is, and I think this seemed to level alluded to it, it's that you, you cut yourself off from serendipity, for one. Yeah. 
and you also shortchange and try to hack a system that eventually might hurt you down the line, where it's like, oh, that's Eric, that's the kid that, you know, tried to do this the wrong way, I don't wanna work with him. Sure, I mean, look, I'm all for shortcuts where you're cutting off unnecessary things that you don't need to do, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, I think ge generally um, doing it right is better than doing it fast. Yeah. And um, it's like whatever the first thing you think you should do is probably not the right thing, you mm -hmm. know? But I, I do, I, you know, not to stereotype millennials, but I do, I think we are kind of, a, having grown up with the internet the way we've grown up with it, there is this belief that because everything is at your fingertips, mm -hmm. because things can magically go viral, you know, because it's so easy to gather large amounts of people, that that, that, that is, that, like that's like, that's the hammer that we have, so everything looks like a nail, mm -hmm. and that the, those tools are a solution to a very small subset of problems. Mm -hmm. Like, again, you can agree or disagree with Thiel's criticism of Gawker and the outcome that he wanted, but I'm not sure there was any other way to accomplish what he wanted to accomplish. You know, so, you know, Denton said to me, he's like, if Thiel's a libertarian, why didn't he meet speech with speech? You know, why didn't he write an op-ed about Gawker? Why didn't he start a rival media outlet? Why didn't he create a public relations campaign. And the reason he didn't do those things is that they wouldn't have worked. Like they wouldn't have destroyed Gawker. He was trying to destroy Gawker. That was the thing he felt needed to be accomplished. Mm -hmm. Again, agree or disagree, that's the fact, that is the strategic objective. Mm -hmm. And he was willing to be patient and creative enough to find the strategy that achieved that objective. Mm -hmm. And you know, meanwhile, I think you know, we're changing our Facebook photos mm -hmm. and thinks that, you know, think that that's going to, you know, uh, you know, intimidate the NRA or something, you know? Like <laughs> the hashtags, bro. Right, right. No, we think we're, look, a hashtag, first off, I'm not actually sure there's that many examples of, like, viral videos or hashtags or social media activism solving that many problems. There was the ALS challenge. That, like, seemed like it actually worked. I wouldn't have thought it would work, but that worked. But, like, very few, pro that, that is not something that's, infinitely replicable, mm -hmm. you know? Like power is somewhat timeless in how it works and it power is typically required to fight power and I think we've, you know, you don't solve every problem by marching. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. And um, on that note, I wanna leave some time for um, some FAQs from QAs from you guys. So um, without further ado, any questions? Yes, Cleo. Do we have to throw this weird microphone? We do, would you like to do the honors? No, you can do it. <laughs> no pressure. Yes, my Tom Brady impersonation. Yeah, that was brilliant. <laughs> Brett Favre. Thanks very much for coming today. Of course. It's really interesting, and I'm looking forward to reading the book. I was wondering, and you sort of started to touch on it a little bit about um, the uh, methodicted ferret attention span of people on the internet. Um, I, I feel like that's progressively gotten worse. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering if you thought that maybe that kind of uh, facilitates conspiracies like this one to go undetected for a long time, because basically everyone put it out of their heads that Peter Thiel had been outed and that was it. They were on to the next thing. Yeah. And, and so it, it, like, there's probably a lot more things like this going on that we don't know about because everyone's looking over there now. Well, look, I mean, you could argue, you know, depending on what you think happened in the 2016 election, whether there was sort of Russian collusion or, you know, intrusion or not, the truth is we were uh, up in arms on social media about a lot of shit that didn't matter, you know, tweets, as opposed to what was sort of happening behind the scenes, what was really going on. So I, th I think you're totally right. I would say there's sort of two things facilitate the conspiracy. So one is that we don't believe these things happen, right? We, we sort of have this simplistic understanding of the world. We think everyone's friends, everything's awesome. And we don't realize that, you know, people have agendas and they're trying to do things. So that, that sort of, like, there's a quote from one of the Gawker writers, it's in the book, it's also in the documentary, where he goes like, we scarcely could have believed something so vindictive and conspiratorial could have happened. Well, it's like, that's exactly why it happened, right? <laughs> you, you literally couldn't believe it could happen, so you didn't see the, somewhat obvious signs in front of you. So I think that's part of it. And then, yeah, as the general public follows, you know, sort of titillating story to story, gets distracted by things, is outraged all the time, in some ways this makes it easier for, um, 
for people to, to, to either get away with things or, you know, Teal was saying that um, at first he was very nervous that people would catch him and he was convinced they would get caught. And then he realized that no one was even looking or thinking about it at all. And that in some ways that was almost more alarming. Yeah, you could kind of argue that the current administration is taking advantage of the fact that you don't remember what happened last week because five other things have happened this week that you've already like put at the top of your brain stack. Yeah, no, I think we're lucky that the chaos is probably more of a byproduct of the incompetence than of sort of Machiavellian <laughs> mastery, you know? Um, but yes, uh, certainly uh, whatever they are doing, uh, the fact that we're exhausted from being outraged all the time is, makes, uh, you know, there's, the resistance is mostly sort of outrage resistance as opposed to, you know, sort of well-organized, established resistance in that more traditional sense. Right. Cool. Just Question over here. Oh, right behind me? Oh. Uh, he was up first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks so much. Um, of course. Yeah, I've uh, read a few of your books and I oh, awesome. quite enjoy them. Um, if you had to pick one feature on social media that you think is causing kind of like a pernicious um, behavioral incentive, yeah. um, which feature would that be? And, and I, I guess you can eliminate that feature. What feature would that be? Um, well, I think one of the m more pernicious and subtle ones was the 140 character limit on Twitter. And, and I think Twitter's uh, over-representation or, or, like, media is on Twitter. Like, normal people don't spend that much time on Twitter anymore, but, like, reporters spend all their time on Twitter. And so I, I think there's been this effect of sort of, you see these smart people who write long-form writing for a living sort of competing with each other to reduce complicated issues to the shortest, snarkiest, least nuanced version of whatever it is. You know, it's like you pull up the hashtag section on Twitter and it's like, you click on it and it's like the same top 100 journalists in America immediately responding and trying to encapsulate this complicated thing with as little nuance as possible, right? And I think that's very bad. Obviously the expansion to 280 characters is better, um, but Probably still, the, it, it's crazy to think that the reason all of that, like the sort of faux certainty and simplification and sort of uh, toxic culture of Twitter just comes from the fact that when they launched, that was how many characters you could send in a text message. Like that's like totally insane to me. And that it, it took so long for them to expand it. And I don't know what they were worried about, but like no, it's, it hasn't changed. It, it made only a marginal, it, it, it's definitely improved the site, I think, but like that they didn't do that in 2010, I think is a travesty. Mm. And we're still dealing with the consequences of that. Indeed. Hi there. Uh, can you point to any media or political event since the Gawker decision that you think might have turned out differently had this case not been decided the way that it was? Like, no. has it impacted us? I don't think so. Uh, well, okay, so on the one hand, uh, simple answer would be no, I don't think so. More complicated answer, Teal and the people around him sort of told me that what he sort of learned in that Florida courtroom, he wasn't there, but what he sort of saw and how this thing developed was part of what gave him both the confidence and the insight to back Trump in the election. So... In that sense, yes. So I don't think it's the precedent of the verdict, like legally, but more like the lessons that were learned there. And then, I mean, you could also argue that uh, sort of Gamergate, which is sort of a movement loosely connected to what happened here, uh, and, and is very much anti-Gawker, um, becomes uh, the alt-right, you know, which becomes, you know, this sort of toxic force in our culture. So I think indirectly, yes. Directly, no. So is that something we should be happy about then, that it hasn't had a chilling effect on media outlets in some way? Well, I mean, it's, it's weird because since 2016, in, at least in terms of traditional journalism, 
You could argue we're living in like a golden age of investigative reporting. I mean, the Harvey Weinstein stuff, the entire Me Too movement. Like, this is all, like, I mean, the traditional media is doing a spectacular, in some ways I think they're doing a terrible job reporting on Trump because uh, they get caught up in things that don't really matter. But they're also doing a fantastic job of just like nuts and bolts reporting on what's happening. So, I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't think there's been a chilling effect. I think, I think the irony is Gawker and this sort of breed of publish first, verify later rumors are just as valid a form of journalism as sort of triple fact check news articles. If anything, that, can, that contributed to the decline in the public's trust in the media and that maybe over time we can come out of that on the other side, but I, I, don't, I don't think it's had the effect that some of the more histrionic critics have, have tried to say that it has. Can you think of an example? I'd be curious. Certainly not off the top of my head. I kind of agree with the golden yeah. age of investigative journalism. But I was also wondering a little bit, is that perhaps because Gawker had this salacious reputation, and if it had been the New York Times or some other reputable uh, media yeah. company, that the jury might not have been so willing to slap them with such a huge penalty? Well, look, the, the, the lawyers who represented Hogan in Florida, not Charles Harder specifically, but the lawyers who represented him in Florida, who did actually most of the arguments in the trial, they uh, represented Sarah Palin in a lawsuit that she did file against the New York Times. It was a, a, a time story. They'd made a mistake. They'd said that she'd like put a target. She didn't, they implied that she'd said that that guy that had uh, attempted to assassinate Gabby Giffords uh, was, uh, was incited by Sarah Palin, which wasn't true. And, and she sued the New York Times, but it was tossed out of court. So. Um, I don't think Teal could have sued and beaten the New York Times. One, I don't think they would have handled it legally the same way. I think they would have done a better job. But two, I don't think he ever would have had the opportunity to do so um, because I don't think they ever would have run a story like this. This, yep. this conversation is really interesting because it's actually causing me to reframe my own opinions on the case because before I had thought it was this uh, a really sad day for yeah. you know First Amendment rights, and now I'm thinking like maybe this is sort of uh, capitalism at its like th at its finest, where we're culling the herd of maybe. media outlets that maybe should have never existed. So, so there was some argument about the chilling effect. They've called it like the Gawker effect, and and the, for instance, there was a story about R. Kelly that uh, a reporter in Chicago tried to publish um, that 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 he, you know, the same sort of R. Kelly <laughs> stories that have gone on for a long time. And, and a couple outlets passed on publishing it, and then BuzzFeed published it. And so there was some, oh, they didn't run it because they were afraid, the other outlets didn't run it because they were afraid of, of you know, being sued. But in the end, an outlet did run it, and they haven't been sued for it. So I mean, I, I don't think a, chill, a chilling effect sounds very ominous, but if a chilling effect is properly defined as the media pausing briefly before publishing an article and making sure that their T's are crossed and their I's are dotted, provided that they do run legitimate stories that pass, that pass sort of legal muster on the other side of that test, I'm not sure that's a bad thing either. And perhaps it's a bad thing that it took this lawsuit to get people to go, oh, let's think about what, let's think about it before we run you know, videos that show up in an anonymous brown envelope from an unnamed source. You know what I mean? It, it could end badly. Uh, yeah, so I'm coming at this from a strange perspective because I've been at Google for a year, but before that, I did six years working at Gawker Media. Mm. Um, yeah, Hot I've twist. seen some shit, guys. Yeah, seen yeah, some shit. I'm sure you have. I'm sure you have. Uh, what's what did you What did you do there? I ran um, film partnerships okay. here in LA. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I know Nick didn't pretty well, yeah, but, sure. um, so, uh, but I had, I have a bunch of questions, but, Go for it. um, to the point you just made though, don't you feel, this is to everybody sort of, um, that there are a lot of, there potentially could be a lot of stories that now news sources are holding back that would make powerful people afraid for fear of, so we don't really know the impact, right? Because people could be holding these stories back sure. that could have legal ramifications, which is No, it's bad. true. Look, Gawker's, as you know, Gawker's sort of, Nick would say that Gawker's sort of ideal story was the kind of story that two journalists would gossip about behind, at, at a bar, right?
right? Like the story that, the, the real story that they hadn't been able to run. Right. And that sounds great in theory, but there could be a lot of reasons why they're not able to run that story, right? It could be that it's not true. It could be that uh, they, haven't, they haven't sort of been able to prove it yet, that they haven't done enough work on it. There could be a lot of reasons. And so, like, um, two journalists gossiping in a bar that a big Silicon Valley investor is semi-openly gay, right, is fine for two journalists to gossip about because it's two people. That's what gossip is, right? But when you publish it in front of potentially millions of people, then it gets more complicated. Do you know what I mean? It gets more complicated. Is it the right thing to do? What is the news, what is the news value of this story? Do the costs outweigh the benefit? So, so I do think Gawker's instinct was always, as you know, to publish, sort of publish first and think about consequences second. Yeah. And that is why they were early to the Louis C.K. story. They were early to a num uh, the Bill Cosby story. They, were, they, they got the story of, of Rob Ford, the Toronto mayor, who was uh, apparently a crack addict. <laughs> like, they were, they were early to a lot of stories, and, and they should be commended for that. Part of the reason those stories didn't have an enormous amount of impact at the time is because people also knew that Gawker's standard for what they ran was not the same as other outlets. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, Nick's theory on the, the you know, the stuff that other places wouldn't publish is why I work there, but yeah. um, I also think they did some indefensible things, so yeah. <laughs> um, it's, compl it's complicated, and in a way, I, I, I respect that Nick, I think Nick is as, we talked a lot about Peter, but I think Nick is as brilliant and as creative and as sort of singularly unique as an individual as Teal is. And in a way, that's probably why they ended up in conflict with each other. Totally. And, and so in some ways, I, I very much respect that was Denton's vision. Like Denton's vision was that the world would be better if those stories that people were gossiping about would be published. And you know, you quoted Taleb. He had a real skin in the game. Like he, he didn't just say this in theory. He built a whole company around it. It reached billions of people. Um, he fought for it. He, he, he also made the calculation, rightly up until this case, that people would get mad about Gawker stories, but would rarely do anything about it. You know, like I think Dent had a very high tolerance for being sued. Mm -hmm. And he was, that's why he was willing to fight this case. And had Teal not been backing Hogan in secret, Hogan probably would have lost. So Teal, so so Denton made the right calculation, given the facts that he had. He just missed a very important fact, which is that, you know, several years previous, he picked a fight with probably the wrong person. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. So I guess my, the question why I okay. wanted this was, uh, so having spent so much time with all of this, yeah, where do you personally sort of land when it comes to the two posts in question? The outing and the sex tape. Do you, when it comes to like, did they have a constitutional right to post yeah. it? And d did they have an ethical, what are the ethics? Yeah, at? so I think constitutionally you have the right to out someone just is in the way that you would have the right to uh, say that someone is having an affair. A, a, a pseudo, it, Teal was not a completely private individual. I mean, he'd sold a company for a billion dollars to eBay. Like. I don't know the sexuality of the other early Facebook investors or really any of the early PayPal investors, but I think he would pass the public figure test enough, and I feel like uh, it shouldn't be seen as a bad thing to be seen as gay. So although he might think it's secret, I don't think it was like illegal by any means. I think there was an ethical consideration that I would probably disagree with Denton on. But I'm also not gay and I haven't lived that life, so I don't have super strong opinions there. Mm. I think the Hogan tape, the First Amendment is very expansive. Uh, celebrities give up a good chunk of their privacy by nature of being public individuals who benefit from publicity. But there is a line somewhere. You know, if, uh, you know, Jennifer Aniston was in a changing room and someone had put a hidden camera there and filmed her and then leaked it to TMZ. Does TMZ have the right to publish that because she's a public individual? Like, because 
she's done nude scenes in movies before? Like, I mean, of, of course not. Like, no, does, does the media have the right to the Aaron Andrews footage? I would say absolutely not. So I feel like there is a line somewhere, and I think we can safely and without endangering our right to free speech say that the line more or less ends at private individuals having sex, in, or any individual having sex in the privacy of a bedroom in a private home. Where it gets interesting, for instance, is like if there was video footage of Donald Trump and Stormy Daniels, does the media have the right to that? Or if there were pictures from the Bill Clinton, Monica Lewinsky uh, uh, scandal, are, is that right? You know, it, it does get, there's not a super bright line where I'd confidently say everything, but I would say this tape, uh, I, I, I think the jury made the right call. $140 million may be too much, yeah. but uh, should, shouldn't, shouldn't have, I think I shouldn't have run it. Yeah. I waffle myself, so I was just curious. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, I think we're, yeah, we're close on time. So, guys, thank you so much for coming out. And I think we have a couple of books still available, so don't be shy. Okay. Come up and grab them. Ryan, you can sign or give high fives or both. All right. wish. Uh, but, guys, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah.